Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center for today's briefing to preview the upcoming series of spacewalks at the International Space Station and the status of SpaceX Crew Dragon, which arrived at the station on May 31st. Joining me in studio today is a panel of experts ready to give those updates. To my right is International Space Station Deputy Program Manager Kenny Todd. To his right is Commercial Crew Program Manager Steve Stitch. And joining us from an adjacent studio to maintain social distancing is International Space Station Flight Director Allison Bollinger and Spacewalk Officer Sandra Moore. We're going to be taking questions through our phone bridge today and via social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Just a reminder, if you're ready to have your question asked, please press star 1 to have your question answered. And if your question has already been answered, be sure to press star 2. Before we get started taking those questions, we're going to open it up here in the room for opening comments. Kenny, take it away. Thanks, Courtney. Well, uh, uh, you used to seeing a few more people in the room here, um, and that's unfortunate. So I, I hope everybody out there is doing doing well. Uh, certainly very excited to be here talking to you today uh, about these EVAs. Uh, hopefully most of you will remember uh, several weeks ago when, when uh, the Demo 2 crew got to orbit and people were asking, well, what are you going to going to do with them. Uh, that was one of the first things out of my mouth is we're going to try to see if we can get some EVAs done uh, while these guys are on board. Uh, certainly Bob Bink and a, a very accomplished uh, spacewalker along with Chris Casty, uh, part of our, our current Increment 63 crew and so we would we wanted to take advantage of that. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve and I, uh, Steve Stitch and I spent quite a bit of time together over the last couple of days and as recently as this morning. Uh, continuing to talk about the forward plan for the Demo 2 crew um, when they're they're going to return, what our thinking is, uh, and how that might fold into our overall EVA plan. Um, again, we'd like to get as many of these EVAs done as we can. We we think it's somewhere between four and six to get both of these uh, power channels uh, swapped in terms of their batteries, and so uh, we're laying in a plan that will allow us to do that. Uh, we got a couple of checkpoints along the way that we're going to going to be using to make sure that the, the two programs are staying in sync relative to, uh, to uh, the overall status with the, uh, with the Crew Dragon. So that's, uh, that's the direction we're heading right now, really excited. Um, this is a little bit of a wash, rinse, repeat for me. I think I've done this briefing on batteries about, about four times, it seems like, because indeed this is the last uh, set of channels that we're going to be doing these lithium ion battery swap outs. And so uh, for me, it's, it's great, uh, it's certainly satisfying to be at this point where we're, where we're going to be finishing up these batteries and, and putting station in a, a much better configuration long term. Uh, these batteries uh, have life, um, you know, 20 plus years, and so uh, I think it's safe to say, barring any unforeseen type of uh, failures, we'll we'll be good on batteries for a number of years to come from a, from a space station program standpoint. And I think that bodes well for all of our users and and certainly all the systems uh, that are currently on board the station. Um, as far as uh, what's going on with vehicle traffic, um, we currently have the HTV. Uh, HTV number nine, uh, currently on space station. Our plan was originally to uh, to set that uh, that particular HTV free on the 20th of July. But in order to enhance our position when it comes to trying to get as many EVAs done as we can, we worked with our JAX colleagues to move that departure date a little bit to the right. So we'll do that sometime out in August. We're still in the process of trying to determine exactly what that date is. Again, along in concert with the commercial crew program, uh, Steve Stitch and his team, to make sure that uh, that we've got everything sequenced right and that uh, we don't put too much on the crew uh, in one short uh, period of time. So anyway, that's all still a plan and work. So um, uh, from there, uh, that'll take us uh, towards the end of the increment. Uh, which at this point will uh, will wrap up around uh, the middle of October time frame when Anatoly um, and Chris and Yvonne uh, return. Uh, they will uh, they will at that point uh, leave the, the the spacecraft in the in the capable hands of Kate Rubens and her uh, Russian crewmates, and uh, they'll take us on through through the end of the year and out into next year. So anyway, right now. Really excited about getting these EVAs going. Uh, we'll, we'll get going this Friday. Uh, after that, we'll do the second EVA on the, on the 1st of July. Uh, in the event that, that we need a third EVA, uh, just because these EVAs tend to run uh, a little bit long, uh, if we have to roll over into a third EVA, we'll do that uh, somewhere around the 6th of July. 
and then and then as far as the second channel goes, um, the, we'll uh, we're still trying to nail down those dates, but hope to get going on that second channel around the middle of July. So we'll uh, we'll pass those dates on to you as as quick as we uh, as as we uh, pound those flat. And with that, I'll uh, I'll hand it over to Steve. Thank thank you, Kenny. It's uh, it's great to be here today. It's exciting to be uh, supporting the space station uh, and your mission. Uh, just give you a little update on the Demo-2 uh, test flight and how things have been going. Kind of hard to believe Endeavor's been docked now for three and a half weeks, so it seemed like it was just yesterday we launched and docked, but we've been at station now for three and a half weeks. Uh, the vehicle's doing extremely well uh, as we put it through its paces. We've been spending a lot of time watching how it performs uh, thermally as we approach the period of time where the sun is a little bit brighter on the orbit and toward the high beta periods. Uh, it's mainly in a quiescent state most of the time, but we power it up every Wednesday to check the systems, to look at the solar ray performance. Uh, in particular, uh, today when we power up, we're going to do some prop system checkouts just to make sure that system's healthy. We're learning a lot about the vehicle, uh, nothing that's uh, of any concern, learning how to manage uh, the systems, the heaters and the thermal performance as we go through uh, the changes in the orbit. Also, we've been watching the power generation of Dragon. Uh, Dragon's generating more power than we expected. Uh, that's going extremely well uh, right now in terms of the predictions of, if you remember when we talked pre-flight, the solar arrays were kind of the limiting uh, item for how long we could stay. Right now, that's right on the predictions, and so we should have about 114 or more days of capability. Uh, did a lot of, still, while we're docked, we're doing a lot of tests uh, for this test flight. Uh, we tested the safe haven capability, that's the capability if the crew needs to go and drag in for some reason, if there were a problem on ISS and stay for 24 hours uh, without any supplies from the space station. We tested that capability. Uh, we've tested data exchange back and forth, voice comm uh, between uh, the space station and Dragon, uh, the standard updates to the crew tablets and procedures. We've tested all that. And then coming up here, probably after the July 4th holiday, we'll have uh, a testing of the habitability on board the Dragon. As we Look ahead toward four crew capability. We'll bring the crew over and uh, look at how we might sleep in Dragon and how we might use the other systems with four crew. And so it's an important demonstration for us. Um, you know, we're looking at landing in the early August time frame. We've been working hand in hand with Kenny to lay out these EVAs. So the first set of opportunities would be in the early August time frame. And really, right now, the way the EVAs are shaping up, we, we think we would land uh, in the August time frame. And so the earliest would be around the 2nd of August, and we're working that, those opportunities with, with the space station program. Uh, just a little bit of a program status. You know, the next vehicle, uh, we are shifting in commercial crew kind of in the middle of this flight from the test flight mentality to getting a more normal capability support space station increments. And so that next vehicle, the Crew-1 vehicle, is right now at the Hawthorne facility in California. It's undergoing checkouts of the propulsion system. So there's a series of, of leak checks and valve checks that happen. Uh, that should be going on through the end of June. Uh, the trunk part of the Dragon will go into acoustic testing uh, later this week. Uh, and then uh, we should ship both the trunk and uh, the Dragon to KSC uh, by the end of next month, by the end of July. They should be at KSC to support Crew-1. Uh, of course, the, that vehicle, the Crew-1 vehicle, has more capability than, than the current Dragon on orbit. It'll have the capability to dock um, at the Zenith port on the top of the space station and also to relocate ports and a few other capabilities. Uh, the launch vehicles are coming along right now. We'll, we're shipping the, the, the first stage for that Crew-1 flight uh, from uh, McGregor, Texas, uh, down to KSC. And then uh, later, and that should happen this week as well, and then, then uh, next month, we should test the second stage for Crew-1 uh, out at McGregor, Texas, and then that will ship down to KSC as well. So we'll be in good position for a Crew-1 launch uh, uh, later this year. We do have been working very carefully the schedule between the Demo-2 landing and Crew-1 launch, and right now we think we need about six weeks of time to review all the data uh, from the, the landing and the undocking and then go through the review process to get to the Crew-1 launch. So there's kind of a six-week uh, iron bar, if you will, between the Demo-2 landing and the Crew-1 launch, and that's going to be a factor as we look at launch dates later on for Crew-1. 
Uh, in terms of Boeing right now, uh, they're targeting for a launch at the end of uh, this year. Uh, made a lot of changes to the uh, vehicle for the second OFT flight. And uh, updating the software is really the pacing item and the testing that's required for that. We had a great review with Boeing uh, on Friday, and that vehicle's progressing well also at KSC. Uh, overall, the CCP team is doing a great job. We're now transitioning into this multi-mission phase to support ISS, and we look forward to working with Kenny on many more missions, including this one. And now I'll turn it over to uh, Allison for more details on the EVA. All right, thank you, Steve. So I'd like to echo Kenny's comments and express how excited our team is to be part of this fourth and final upgrade of lithium ion batteries aboard the International Space Station. So also echoing Kenny's comments, it's gonna feel a lot like a rinse and repeat if you were here for the P6 EVAs that we did in October of last year and January of this year. But if you'll humor me for a few minutes, since this, this is the last time we'll be briefing these battery EVAs, we'll take a quick walk down memory lane. So we first started the lithium ion battery upgrades on the S4 truss back in 2017. And then we followed on with the P4 truss in 2019 and what's different about those EVAs and when we started moving farther outboard is due to the close proximity to the center line of the space station we were able to use SPM or the special purpose dextrous manipulator to do a majority of the heavy lifting in terms of the lithium ion versus nickel hydrogen battery swaps so for each of those elements we only needed one EVA per channel or two EVAs total to finish up what batteries SPDM couldn't reach and then to in install the adapter plate and its associated electrical connector that completes the circuit between the lithium ion battery and the, the uh, BCDU pair or battery charge discharge unit. Are you leaving? <laughs> so with all that in mind, once we started moving farther outboard on the P6 truss, SPDM isn't able to reach out that far, so we had to do all the heavy lifting by hand, by gloved hand, if you will. So on P6, if you'll remember, when we started to step into these EVAs in October, the original plan was for a five EVA series. It would take them two and a half EVAs to do the first channel, two and a half EVAs to do the second channel. They were able to find some efficiencies real time as they were doing these EVAs to get those down within the four EVA box, and so we're using their legwork work as the foundation for our four EVA series. So as Kenny mentioned, we're first going to start out on Friday and then on July 1st to do the one Bravo channel. So we'll have two EVAs associated with one Bravo, and then we'll have two EVAs associated with, with three Bravo at a later date. So I mentioned we fit within the EVA box. We just barely fit within the four EVA box. And so for our first EVA, we'll be running a little bit longer than our standard six and a half hours. That EVA will be six hours and 40 minutes. And our fourth EVA, or the second three Bravo EVA, will be about six hours and 50 minutes. So these EVAs will be traditionally longer than the six and a half hours that we normally schedule these EVAs. But the benefit we have, the, the kind of ace up our sleeve, if you will, is the crew that we're sending out the door to do these EVAs. So we're utilizing the ISS Commander Chris Cassidy, as well as the Demo 2 crew member Bob Bankin. And these guys come to us with 12 EVAs of experience under their belt, each having spent over 30 hours outside the safe confines of the ISS, inside an EMU or extravehicular mobility unit servicing the space station. The added experience that Chris brings to the table is actually on his first shuttle mission, STS-127, back in 2009, he performed some battery EVAs out on the P6 side of the truss. And in that case, that was just upgrading or just swapping out nickel hydrogen batteries for fresh nickel hydrogen batteries. But it's a great benefit that, that Chris comes to us already having this battery experience in his toolkit, if you will. So with the, with the vast experience we have with these two crew members, fingers crossed that we'll be able to complete these EVAs and the four EVAs we have planned and not required the additional two EVAs that Kenny alluded to. So inside the space station, getting the guys ready to go out the door, we have Doug Hurley and cosmonaut Yvonne Wagner uh, serving the role as suit IV, which is helping getting the, the crew members suited up and then getting them outside the door. So Yvonne will be playing the role of primary or prime suit IV for the first EVA with Doug providing assistance, and then they'll swap roles for all the remaining EVAs where Doug will be the prime suit IV and Yvonne will be providing the second set of hands when needed for things like safer donning, the simplified aid for EVA rescue, where it really helps helps to have that second set of hands in the airlock. By having Yvonne play the role of prime suit IV for the first EVA, this allows Doug to also focus on getting ready for his role as M1 or the lead robotics officer. So Doug's role will be to hold, will be to maneuver the 
uh, the EP. So the EP is the exposed platform that launched on HTV9 just about a month ago. So Doug will hold, using the SSRMS, will hold the EP in position out at the integrated equipment assembly on the IEA to allow Chris to work on removing the new lithium ion batteries, associated adapter plates, and stowing the old batteries. So Doug, Doug's maneuvers with the arm are fairly straightforward, just moving the EP back and forth, or possibly backing it out and rotating it to expose a different side of the EP to Chris. So since the maneuvers are fairly straightforward, the camera views are good, and, and Doug's work is, is pretty straightforward, we're able to utilize a ground M2. So traditionally, we'll have a, an, an onboard second set of eyes looking over the robotics operator's shoulders to make sure things are going swimmingly. But since, as I mentioned, things are fairly straightforward, and also the fact that we don't have a crew member riding on the arm, we'll be using our robotics officer here in Houston to serve the role of M2. So on board the space station, the preparations for the spacewalk are marching right along. The teams have spent tens of hours getting ready for these spacewalks. So we allowed Doug and Bob to get their space legs under them for only about a week before we put them to work getting ready for these EVAs. So they've spent numerous hours working on tool inspections, tool configurations, suit readiness, uh, procedure reviews, space to ground conferences with the team here in Houston, and then most of that work culminated into the on-orbit fit verification just yesterday. So that allowed Doug and Yvonne to get some practice, hands-on practice with a, a real live EMU to help get Bob and Chris suited up. It allowed Bob and Chris to verify that their suits fit like a glove, well at least the glove part of the suits fit like a glove and the rest of the suit fits adequately. So that allowed them to get uh, practice and Bob and Chris both gave a thumbs up that their, their suits are great and ready to go and this will allow Chris uh, sorry, uh, Doug and Yvonne to be as efficient as possible getting them out the door on Friday. So just as many hours on board the space station have been spent getting ready for this EVA, just as many, if not more, I'm sure, hours on the ground have also been spent getting ready. I alluded to some of the robotics work that we've done thus far. When HTV arrived just about a month ago, we quickly got to work swapping out the exposed platforms. So we still had HTV 8's EP with the old nickel hydrogen batteries from P6 stowed on the mobile transporter. So robotically, we were able to remove that one. Uh, release the new exposed platform from HTV, install it on the POA, put the old one back in HTV, and now things are good to go. And then we were also able to use SPDM to go ahead and release the higher torque that the uh, new lithium ion batteries were set to during launch. So SPDM helped us out there. We have translated the mobile transporter out to work site one just this morning, so it's all the way out on the end of the starboard truss ready for our, our EVAs. And just in about an hour from now, we'll work on grappling that EP uh, from the POA and then moving it out to position out on S6. As far as readying the power channel for the for the R&R &R on Friday. So yesterday morning, we did what we call a seamless power channel handover, where we tied the one Bravo loads to one alpha. So the one alpha channel is now carrying not only its downstream loads, but also all the loads associated with one Bravo. That then allowed flight controllers on the ground to start the 50-hour discharge of the six nickel hydrogen batteries that will start the removal of on Friday. So we're well into that 50 hours. Things are looking great. So this will make sure that the batteries are fully drained for the crew to safely release them on Friday. So leading the teams on the ground, we'll have Royce Renfrew will be the lead flight director for the one Bravo EVAs, and I will be the lead flight director for the three Bravo EVAs. And to my right, socially distanced appropriately, is my lead EVA officer, Dr. S Dr. Sandra Moore. So Sandy will be giving more of the specific details on the EVAs. Yes, and thank you, Allison. Um, as Allison mentioned, I am the EVA officer for the three Bravo channel. My colleague, Jacqueline Kagey, will be the lead EVA officer for the One Bravo channel. She will be working uh, under the guidance and leadership of Flight Director Royce Renfro and alongside of Ground IV Capcom astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli. I'll be working under the guidance and leadership of Allison um, Bollinger and alongside the astronaut Ground IV Capcom Josh Kuchik. On board, we have our extravehicular crew members, Chris Cassidy and Bob Bankin. Chris will wear the extravehicular uh, EV1 stripes uh, for the first two EVAs, and much like the ground teams, uh, they will swap roles, and Bob Bankin will wear the red stripes for the second EVAs. Uh, as mentioned, Doug Douglas Hurley and Yvonne Wagner will help us out performing the suit IV operation and Doug will remain with us throughout the day performing the robotics operations necessary for EVA. 
EVA day for us, for our crew, is a very long day. Uh, for example, this Friday, our crew members will begin very early, around 1.30 a.m. Houston time. They'll begin their EV preparations uh, around 4 a.m. They'll be jumping into their in-suit light exercise pre-breathe protocol. This, like the name suggests, the crew jumps into their, their suits and begins to breathe pure O2 while performing um, some light exercise with short rest breaks. Uh, that exercise equates to slightly moving their, their arms and legs, and that allows us to uh, jostle any nitrogen out of the system uh, when possible. Um, from then, uh, once our pre-breathe is complete, we'll put the crew in the Quest airlock and we'll depress them down to, to vacuum where we can begin our extravehicular activities. Uh, for us in particular, we're going to head out as far starboard as we can to the S6 work site um, out on the integrated equipment assembly, and we're going to be changing out some aging nickel hydrogen batteries with some brand new lithium ion batteries that arrived on uh, HTV9 just recently. Uh, two nickel hydrogen batteries equate to one lithium ion battery, so we can change those out, but we still have to complete that circuitry. And to do that, we'll install what we call an adapter plate. When complete, it also conveniently gives us a spot for uh, a nickel hydrogen battery to be stowed. Uh, we do have some animations to take you through the specifics of the EVA. Um, due to the similarity in choreography, we will only be playing uh, animations for the first EVA and the fourth. This EVA begins the one Bravo power channel upgrade. Chris, wearing the red stripe, egresses first. He sets up their tether anchors away from the airlock to enable them to go farther outboard. Then Bob, wearing the white stripe, grabs his foot restraint and follows outboard. Chris picks up his foot restraint on the cedar cart and heads to the external pallet, or EP. The external pallet is held by the robotic arm and houses the new batteries launched from Japan on HTV9 in May. Chris sets up his tools and prepares his worksite. Bob translates to the S6 Integrated Electronics Assembly, or IEA, which will be his main worksite throughout the EVA. The IEA houses the batteries and hardware for the 1B solar arrays and power channel. Chris will join Bob and they work together to finish setup. First, battery from slot number one is retrieved. The crew needs to release torque with a ratchet, then use the pistol grip tool, or PGT, to complete the release of the bolts. The large battery is removed, and the crew work together to move it over to the EP for disposal. Chris ingresses the foot restraint and the crew work together to install the battery in empty slot X. Then the arm maneuvers to place Chris in front of the first new battery in slot A. After placing scoops to create handholds, the crew will remove the battery and translate it back to the truss and install in empty slot number one. Throughout the EVAs, Bob will need to move his foot restraint to reach each battery. Next, the battery in slot 2 is removed and translated over to the pallet. At the EP, Chris is in a foot restraint and places the battery on his BRT, or body restraint tether. Chris will release the adapter plate launched underneath the battery. Like with the batteries, he has to use the ratchet to release the high torque and then the PGT to fully release the bolt. Chris removes the adapter plate to hand to Bob. Bob translates back to the truss to install the adapter plate in open slot 2. At the same time, Chris is putting the old battery in the slot he had just emptied for disposal. Together on the IEA, they made a cable between the adapter plate and the new battery to complete the circuit. With one of the three battery pairs complete, they move to slot 3 to remove the next old battery. This battery will be stowed on the adapter plate in slot 2, where it is no longer needed to function. Bob and Chris return to the pallet to retrieve battery B. They repeat the steps to release the bolts, translate back to the truss, 
and together install in empty slot number three. At this point, Bob and Chris begin cleanup on the first of the two One Bravo battery channel EVAs. They also prepare for the next EVA, including moving foot restraints, securing tools, and bags where they will be needed. Once the worksite is clean, Chris translates from the end of the S6 truss, pausing to reconfigure their safety tethers on the return to the airlock. Bob follows for ingress, completing Power Channel 1 Bravo EVA 1. And on to 3 Bravo EVA 2, the fourth EVA in the series. 3 Bravo EVA 2 will begin at the Quest airlock. Mr. Bob Bankin, EV1 will egress first. Mr. Chris Cassidy, EV2, will egress second with an ORU bag. After completing buddy checks, Bob will lead out to the worksite. Crew will translate up the Cetus Burr, outboard of the Solar Alpha Rotary Joint, to S6, and drop a tether fair lead. Bob will then prep his IEA foot restraint for battery operations. Chris will start his day at the external pallet foot restraint. After verifying settings, Chris will stow an ORU bag on the external pallet and prep a pistol grip tool with a 9 nits hex driver for future adapter plate operations. Meanwhile, back at the IEA, Bob is setting up 3 Bravo for battery operations by relocating a PGT near battery 4. Once complete, Chris will join Bob on the IEA. Chris will hand Bob a ratchet wrench to break torque on nickel hydrogen battery number 4. Once complete, Chris will hand Bob a PGT with a 6 inch wobble and begin to fully release battery 4 by driving H1 followed by H2. Bob will then release the old nickel hydrogen battery 4 from soft dock and hand it to Chris. Bob will egress the foot restraints and both crew will interim battery 4 to the external pallet. At the EP, Chris will ingress the foot restraints and Bob will hand Chris the battery and he will stow it on his BRT. Bob will translate onto the external pallet and help Chris release adapter plate Echo. Using a ratchet wrench with hex driver, crew will break torque on both bolts. Bob will then hand Chris a PGT with a hex driver, and he will continue to fully release the adapter plate by driving H1 followed by H2. Once Bob stows the PGT, he will translate back to the truss. Chris will re release adapter plate echo from soft dock and hand it to Bob, who will begin translation back to the 3 Bravo IEA. Chris will install the old nickel hydrogen battery 4 into slot Echo by driving H2 with full torque. Chris will then retrieve two scoop handling aids and relocate them to lithium ion battery Charlie for future operations. Chris will then translate back to the truss. Once far enough away, the Canadian arm will reposition to expose battery Charlie to crew for later operations. Back at the IAA, Bob ingressed the foot restraint and began to install the adapter plate echo into slot 4. During the time Crystal returned to the IEA and relocate handling aids for the next battery, battery 6. Once complete with the adapter plate bolts, a connector will be installed from the adapter plate to the lithium ion battery, completing the circuitry for battery charging and discharging. The crew will then break into the last pair of nickel hydrogen batteries on the IEA. Torque will be broken on battery 6 with a ratchet wrench. Then both bolts will be fully released with the PGT H1 followed by H2. Battery 6 will then be released from soft dock, handed to Chris, and Bob will rotate his foot restraints over adapter plate echo and then soft dock the nickel hydrogen battery. Bob will drive H2 followed by H1 to secure battery 6 in its final stow position on top of adapter plate echo. Bob will then egress the APFR, rotate, and then relocate two handling aids and prep for battery 5. Bob will then translate out to the external pallet to assist Chris with battery Charlie. During that time, Chris was working to release battery Charlie from the external pallet. He will hand battery Charlie to Bob and both will interim back to the IEA. Bob will ingress the foot restraint and install battery Charlie into slot 6. Bob will drive H2 followed by H1, completing battery Charlie install. Bob will egress and relocate and reposition the APFR for battery 5 operations. Bob will re-ingress the APFR and Chris will hand Bob a ratchet wrench to break torque on the battery 5 bolts. 
He will then fully release the bolts, H1, followed by H2, using a PGT with a 6-inch wobble. Bob will then remove battery 5 from soft dock, hand it to Chris, and both will inchworm back to the external pallet. At the EP, Chris will ingress the foot restraint and install the battery on its body restraint tether. Bob will translate back onto the external pallet to assist Chris in releasing adapter plate Charlie. Using a hex driver, Chris will brick torque, and then use a PGT with the hex driver to fully release the adapter plate. Bob will reposition back to the truss. Chris will hand the adapter plate to Bob, and Bob will begin translation back to the 3 Bravo IEA. Chris will remain behind and install the old nickel hydrogen battery 5 into slot Echo. Chris will then clean up the two scoops and PGT in the medium over U bag and then bundle it to the EP foot restraint. Back at the IA, Bob will ingress the foot restraint and install adapter plate Charlie into slot 5, fully driving H2 and H1 to torque with the PGT and hex driver. Once complete, a connector will be installed from the adapter plate to the lithium ion battery, completing the three Bravo circuitry for battery charging and discharging. Crew will then work together to clean up the IEA. Four scoops and two gap spanner pairs will be gathered into the crew lock bag. PGT will be stowed on Bob's swing arm. Bob will then retrieve the crew lock bag and bundle it to the IEA foot restraint. Both crew will grab foot restraints and stow them on their BRTs. Crew will be the, then begin to translate inboard. Chris will lead. Bob will stop at the starboard seat of cart with five for a final stowage of his foot restraint. Chris will continue on and translate all the way to ESP2 with four for his final location. Once complete, Chris will grab his ORU bag, head back toward the airlock, but will continue up the seat of spur to grab a couple of adjustable tether fair leads. These were used to keep the tether out of the way for ingress throughout the entire series of these battery EVAs. Crew will meet back up at the airlock, stow their bags, and ingress the airlock. And this concludes the nominal task plan for US 3 Bravo EVA 2. And thanks to our panel for opening it up today. We're going to go ahead and open it up for questions now. Just a reminder, if you're on the phone bridge, be sure to press star one if you'd like your question answered and star two if your question has already been answered. And if you're on social media, be sure to submit your questions using the hashtag AskNASA. We'll take the first question from our phone bridge, Bill Harwood with CBS. Bill, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. How do you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Um, my question, and you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, looking at Binken and realizing he has a ton of EVA experience, did he get the same amount of training on the ground before launch that you would normally provide to an astronaut going into a battery swap EVA? In other words, did he get a compressed schedule to get him ready for this, and, and, and how did it compare with anybody else who would be flying this mission? Thanks. Let's see. Uh, the answer is yes, he did get some training. Um, in terms of the exact number of runs, uh, what the ratio is, I probably have to let Allison uh, address that. But uh, uh, we did. We made a, a conscious effort to get uh, both both Bob and Doug trained up, knowing that uh, doing these EVAs was a possibility. But in terms of the specific ratio and how that that measures up to uh, to what we would typically do for an increment crew, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd have to let Allison take a, take a cut at that. Allison, do you have anything to add? We'll go ahead and have Sandy answer it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, oh, so both our crew have had experience with, with batteries uh, in the MBL recently. They both have a, a plethora of EVAs under their belts. Um, so before going, we did make sure that they, they got a run at these batteries in the MBL. Uh, Chris, in particular, actually developed or helped develop the P6 uh, choreography, so he knows it quite well. And Bob, with his experience with EVAs, uh, got to run it on the pool just recently, right before launch. Uh, so they are ready and, and ready to go. And our next question comes from social media. Rohan asks, how long will Doug Hurley and Bob Bankin stay on the space station? Yeah, I, I can address that. We, Again, Kenny and I have been meeting and, and working, you know, right now, the way um, Kenny has laid out the EVAs. It looks like the first opportunity to undock and come home would be around August the 2nd. Uh, we'll just have to sort of see how the EVAs go. And then we're really trying to set us up for uh, allow that time frame in August to come home. So so that's the first opportunity would be around August the 2nd. And uh, 
keep we'll keep working with Kenny and see how the EVAs go. I've been in this business quite some time, and somehow you lay out a plan and things go according to the plan. Sometimes they go off schedule, but right now we're looking at around that August the second time frame. All right, and back to our phone bridge, Chelsea Goad from Space.com. Chelsea, go ahead. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, I have just uh, kind of a question and a half regarding Crew Dragon. So you mentioned a number of tests that have so far been done with Crew Dragon on orbit, and I'm curious what tests remain um, from now until the time when the craft is sent home, and then kind of compounding on that question, I'm curious if you could go into a little bit more detail about the solar panels, um, which you mentioned were doing better than expected. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, while we're docked, the next big test that I spoke of was the habitability test. So we'll bring uh, four crew over into the, into the Dragon and really start to look at what does it look like in Dragon with four crew. Uh, of course, we just have Bob and Doug there now. They're going to do... Uh, some things like a, a test of how they would sleep and position themselves for sleep, uh, some hygiene kind of task, um, in an emergency how they would transition from a breathing mask into the spacesuit if they had to do that, and some of those kind of ac activities are mainly what's planned in that test. And then, of course, for us, the big test remaining on this test flight is undock, deorbit entry and landing, and recovery of Bob and Doug for the first time. You know, we did the, the entry and undock on, on Demo-1 with an uncrewed spacecraft. Uh, that went extremely well. The entry was, was very nominal. Uh, for us this time, it includes Bob and Doug. It includes some unique things to, uh, to keep them uh, safe should they have a, a depress event, they have a, a suit on. Uh, there's an AC system that has to work uh, post-landing. And then the recovery operation of getting um, the Dragon vehicle from the water back onto the, sh the ship. That's another big test coming up. Um, and then in terms of the solar arrays, uh, you know, these solar arrays, um, we thought pre-mission they might have a propensity to cycle uh, with thermal changes in temperature over uh, an orbit. And so we thought they may degrade at a certain rate. Uh, right now what we're seeing is they're, they're really de degrading a little bit better than prediction. And so that's what gives us the capability to stay uh, on orbit for uh, uh, up to 119 days, 114 days or so docked. So, so they're doing well. What we do is we power the vehicle up and we power the vehicle up. We can see the generation of uh, the power from that array. Um, every Wednesday and then we can kind of trend that over time and, and right now it's looking very promising. And our next question comes from Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Marsha? Yes, hello. Um, I'm wondering if the spacewalk slip out a little farther, would you delay um, the Crew Dragon crew from coming back at the beginning of August? I mean, would you slip that for that reason alone? And would you be okay with doing three out of the four spacewalks and just leaving that last four spacewalk for some future crew? Well, Marcia, um, the, uh, the, I'll start with the, the last question first. The EVAs themselves are, are basically um, focused on, on doing uh, two, separate, two separate battery channels. And, and once you start off into, into swapping out the batteries for one of the battery channels, you really need to stay committed and, and get that channel back up and running. Otherwise, we're, we're looking at running for some amount of time. So, so really, we're, we're in the neighborhood of an even number of EVAs uh, per, per channel, or, or uh, and hopefully totally somewhere around four EVAs is what we're looking at. If we end up with a fifth, that means we have to do three on one channel and two on another. But the goal, the goal is to once you start out with, an, with the first EVA on a channel, you don't stop from an EVA perspective until you recover that channel. So, so uh, we wouldn't probably put ourselves in a position where we would go, go into that second channel knowing that we might only, only uh, get the channel taken down and, and part, of the, part of the battery swapped out. We really do want to do that second EVA on that channel and give ourselves a chance to get it, get it back up and running before, before uh, Bob and Doug come home. Um, as far as, as delays, the, the plans that we're looking at uh, with Steve, um, if we move the, the EVAs uh, a little, little further out into July, we still think there's a, a path that gets us there to be done in time um, before the end of July. That's, that's the challenge I've, I've given to the team is let's do everything we can do to try to get these EVAs done in July. And I think we have 
We have multiple options that allow us to do that, uh, again, with a little bit of margin. So uh, if, we, uh, if we get to the point where we've completed one channel and before we start the second channel, we'll, we'll most certainly uh, have, a, have a discussion with the commercial crew program, the SpaceX team, and, and make sure that we're all on the same page, that it's the right decision to go ahead and go for that second channel. That's, uh, that's kind of been the path that we've laid out, and, and we're not, uh, we won't deviate from, from that if we, uh, if we start to slip, slip things to the right a little bit. We're going to continue to talk and, and make sure that uh, we're taking all the factors into account before we'll, we'll allow the Dragon to, to slip any further into August. And our next question comes from social media from Archie. Why is there a requirement of replacing lithium ion batteries with nickel hydrogen batteries instead of just replacing with new lithium ion batteries? Well, uh, what we're doing is we're going to a newer technology. With the lithium ion batteries are, are basically a newer technology you can, uh, with a, a smaller footprint. Uh, you can you can get way more storage capacity on orbit, which is the reason that that we we made the, the leap in technology several years ago to say let's go from nickel hydrogen to lithium ion. So over the past well four years now, uh, over four years, we've been slowly swapping out from the nickel hydrogen to the lithium ion. Um, one of the primary benefits is that the, the the packaging for the lithium ion batteries is much smaller, and so therefore we can launch much more capability, much more uh, capacity battery-wise in the HTVs, and so we don't need as many HTV flights to get these batteries to orbit. So we can get much more uh, energy capacity, and we can do it with less flights going to the International Space Station uh, carrying up these new batteries. So that's two of the biggest reasons why, and, and, and quite frankly, the, uh, the, uh, the longevity of the, of, the, of the new technology batteries gets us out again. Uh, well out uh, through the what will most likely be the end of the program, uh, whereas the nickel hydrogens had a, a, a life of around six, six to seven or eight years, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll be much better off for the long term by, by having the lithium ion batteries. And back to our phone bridge, Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Stephen, go ahead. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, uh, questions for uh, Steve Stitch. Uh, first of all, the, the habitability test planned around the July 4th time frame, uh, will the four crew members actually sleep overnight in Crew Dragon, or will they just assess, you know, the sleeping berths and quarters, uh, you know, during the day and then return to station? And also, uh, can you talk about the various landing sites and scenarios that are in play for the return of Demo 2? I think you have a few landing sites in the Atlantic and then in the Gulf as a, as a backup. Can you talk about where each of those are located and what your primary return uh, landing return site will be um, on in early August? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for the question. Uh, right now, there's no plan really to have the crew sleep overnight. Um, we can get back and check, but I'm pretty sure that the plan is just to come in and and do an assessment of sleeping and not sleep overnight in Dragon. Uh, from what we heard from Bob and Doug a little bit in s some debriefs, the, the sleeping was fine on, on the way up the one night that they spent uh, there in Dragon on the way. Um, in terms of landing sites right now, we have three landing sites. Uh, we have a landing site um, on the east coast of Florida off of Jacksonville. Uh, we have a site directly uh, east of, of the Cape called the Cape site, and then we have uh, a site off of Pensacola. Uh, we're in the process of looking at adding uh, some additional sites, uh, one off of uh, Tallahassee, uh, one off of Tampa, one off of Daytona Beach, and then Panama City, Florida. Uh, we're also in the process of figuring out, you know, early on we sort of thought the prime would always be the Cape site. Um, it was a little bit better to transport the crew back on shore, and then um, the backup would always be uh, uh, Pensacola. Uh, right now, we're looking at, just based on the way the orbits line up, we're trying to come up with a strategy for which one would be prime. Uh, it could be driven by weather. You know, as we get into the August time frame, you start getting more tropical activity. So once we pick a landing date, we may choose one of those sites. We'll always have at least one backup site uh, once we undock. So our, our rules tell us we ought to have two go sites to undock. And so we're in the middle of coming up with that strategy for uh, how we lay out the sites, um, if that makes sense. And David Mosier with Business Insider. David, go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you for taking my question. Steve, this is for you, um, kind of springing off that, that last thing you just said. Um, 
regarding Demo 2's return. So the undocking, um, I'm really curious what, you know, if in an ideal scenario, what the timeline for return to Earth would look like in terms of, um, you know, what, what when the burns are, or roughly how far apart those are. Um, yeah, so from undocking to landing in an ideal scenario at, at your ideal landing location, what does the timing look like? What are the, um, how many hours are between each phase, I guess? That's sort of a detailed uh, question, and maybe you don't have an answer, but if you do, great. Thank you. Yeah, I can give you a little thumbnail sketch of how it looks, and it, the, the short answer is it really depends. And so uh, we'll obviously line up the, uh, the undocking uh, from space station, the actual undocking event with, with the crew sleep schedule of station and all the, the various constraints with space station. And then from that undock event, there's a series of, of burns that back away uh, from station. And then we'll do a sequence of uh, maneuvers to get uh, up and around and clear of station. And then the time frame from undock to actual landing varies. It depends on when that undock point is and the landing sites. And so it varies anywhere from uh, on the order of six hours to maybe a mid-range of, of 15 to 20 hours. And there's some other cases that uh, would get you out there into 30 hours from undock to landing. It just sort of depends on the sites. Uh, the vehicle has consumables for about three days after we undock, so we've got plenty of capability once we undock. And so um, it just depends on the sequence of sites and the sequence we set up as to how long it is from undock to landing. Okay, and our next question comes from social media. How do you clean a spacesuit after a spacewalk? And I can take that one if you like. Uh, so we, we do quite a bit of work to clean a, a spacesuit after a spacewalk. Um, the crew will come in and they will uh, doff their spacesuits. Um, the, the suit ivy gets the lucky um, role of getting to wipe it out. It is a bladder inside, so kind of a plastic bladder that you can actually wipe off and get rid of all, any of the sweat or any of the other uh, fluids in, in the spacesuit itself. Um, and then the internal PLIS or the, the life support system, we do have to scrub um, after a series of EVAs, sometimes in the middle if they're the longer ones, where we'll actually scrub all, all the water out for any tiny particulate and add iodine to make sure we don't have any uh, growth or any, anything inside the suit. We call that a loop scrub. And maybe another question for, me, for you, Sandra, from Yandy. Um, how long does it take to put on and take off a spacesuit? Uh, it's, it's not terribly long, but it can be quite challenging. And it's funny because it's the inverse problem we have on the ground. Um, on orbit, it's a little bit easier to get in the spacesuits um, because there's no gravity. But then you have the opposite problem trying to get out. So it takes on the order of, of five to ten minutes to don and doff it itself. Um, now pre-breathe is what takes the, the, is the longer pull because we do spend a lot of time making sure that their bodies are conditioned to go down to vacuum. And so that's the part that takes the long part. To don the suit itself is... It's on the order of about 10 minutes. Um, but to watch them get out is kind of fun. Sometimes you'll see the, the suit IV kind of put their feet on them and wiggle them out, and so it's kind of fun. And one more question from social media, and this might be one that the both of you here in this studio can answer. How happy have you been with the collaboration between NASA and SpaceX on this last mission? I, I can start and then let, let Kenny add. I mean, SpaceX is an incredible partner. It's been an incredible uh, team working you know, for many, many years to get both Dragon and, and F-9, Falcon 9 ready to go. Uh, incredible uh, engineering, incredible team uh, both on both sides. Uh, the ops from SpaceX has been incredible. You know, this is their first crewed mission, but you can just tell how much they've learned from all the cargo flights as they embarked upon this crew mission. And then just leading up to the launch and the launch countdown operations, just incredible teamwork, incredible partnership. And then we're working ahead already on Crew 1 and then Crew 2 and all the future missions. So it's just been incredible. Uh, also working with the Space Station program, I think we've got a good three-way uh, team between Space Station, SpaceX, and then the Commercial Crew program. Yeah, uh, great words, Steve. Yes, um, you know, from a Space Station standpoint, we've been working with, with SpaceX uh, doing dynamic operations for a, a number of years, you know, going on a decade here. and. Uh, uh, it's it's been kind of kind of cool to because some of the folks that rolled off of off of the cargo uh, flights actually came and went into the uh, to the CCP world and, and worked with Steve and his his team and so it's been great to get to contact 
reconnect with some of those folks again and as we work through all the, the details of this particular mission and, and it's clear that um, you know our early early um, uh, working together uh, is, has been beneficial for all of us. It really has helped pave the way for what I think is a, a really good partnership and uh, and it's a, it's it's been a joy and and uh, we've really appreciated the opportunity to work with with Steve and his team and and certainly with SpaceX and again re get to renew some some connections that we've lost track of over the last few years so it's been really good and that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank our panel of experts for joining us today and, of course, all of you who called in or asked questions via social media. Be sure to tune in to watch the spacewalk unfold this Friday, Friday, June 26th, on our live coverage starting at 5 a.m. Central. And that'll wrap up our briefing for today. Thanks for tuning in.